Hello, and welcome to the Princeton Festival's video lecture series on Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's Le Nozzi di Figaro. This opera, which premiered in 1786, is still considered by many to be the greatest comic opera ever written. So, in the videos that follow, we're going to delve into exactly why we feel that to be the case still today. We're going to look at the background of the opera, talk about the historical context, and then delve into what Mozart does to certain passages, to certain characters, to certain moments in the drama that really continue to speak to us today as they spoke to various commentators and audiences of the 18th century. So I hope you enjoy, and without further ado, let's go. Before we begin, let's just take a moment to look at the lecture topics for each of the four videos, and then we'll dive into video one. So in this first lecture, we're going to look at the background to the opera, its cultural context, what Mozart's getting up to in Vienna at the time, his relationship with the librettist Lorenzo de Ponte, and briefly the reception of the opera. Then we'll pivot from there to look at the simple means that Mozart and de Ponte used in order to create a successful opera. So they drew on some background knowledge about their audience's experiences, and they also did very specific things with the text and the music throughout the opera. For illustration, we're going to use the very opening of the opera, Act One, Scene One, with Figaro and Suzanne. In video two, we're going to turn to characterization. We're going to do so through the lens of just two of the wonderful cast of characters. We will look first at Figaro, the barber and servant figure, and we'll use him as a way to explore uh, what this opera has to do with social, uh, social roles and class struggles. And then we're also going to look at the Seria character, uh, Countess Almaviva. In fact, a Seria character caught in a buffa uh, opera, a comedic opera. In the third video, we'll turn to the act two finale of the opera. Uh, buffa finales were an expected part of opera going culture in Vienna at the time. So we'll explore a little of the cultural context of this form. And then we're going to look at specifically what Mozart does with this particular form. His sort of skill in writing for uh, multiple singers singing at the same time or writing for ensembles. Uh, in the act two finale, perhaps one of the best pieces of music he ever wrote, certainly one of the best regarded pieces, uh, we see him rising to the challenge that is presented by expectations of the Buffa finale. And then in the final video, we're going to turn to the issue of beautiful music in Mozart. Critics and historians for decades and centuries have written about Mozart's beautiful music. It's one of the most, uh, most popular topics of Mozartian criticism. So with this specific opera, we're going to look at the idea of the beautiful in the context of a comic opera. Why is this beautiful music cropping up? What is it made out of? What, how is it put together? And what does that tell us about how we can choose to interpret the opera? So without further ado, let's jump into lecture one with the background to the opera. 1786, May 1st, the opera premieres in Vienna, the court theater under Emperor, Emperor Joseph II, who uh, at that point, Mozart was trying to ingratiate himself with many times. So Mozart, in fact, had been in the city for multiple years at this point. He had arrived in Vienna again in 1783 after a period of uh, writing, and, writing and performing in Salzburg in, in Austria. He comes to Vienna seeking his fortunes, basically. He wants to establish his reputation as one of the foremost uh, musicians in Europe at the time. And in order to do that, where are you going to go? Well, Vienna perhaps the musical capital of that part of Europe. Uh, so Mozart is at the time not particularly uh, writing operas. In fact, he is trying to secure an opera commission and the fruits of those labors are eventually Le Nazi di Figaro. So Figaro would like to, so Figaro at this point is not yet in Mozart's, uh, in Mozart's oeuvre. He is, in fact, performing largely, as well as tutoring various noble persons, and, uh, a lot of noble women. He is performing in public subscription concerts. This is where we see a lot of Mozart's famous piano concertos being written, 
Mozart demonstrating a penchant for brilliant music produced at the last minute. Uh, he is something of a wonderful improviser and uh, certainly the piano being his uh, primary instrument and him being one of the top pianists in Europe at the time uh, often leaves the composition of his, his part to the last minute uh, in ways that are procrastinating, sure, but also send the idea of virtuosity to his audience. He is also at the time performing in private performances, private concerts. The most notable of these perhaps, or certainly the most well-known today, is a piano competition that he has with the Italian uh, composer and musician Muzio Clementi. This is as part of a friendly wager that the Emperor uh, Joseph II in fact wins when Mozart is agreed to have won the competition. However, Mozart is suitably threatened by Clementi as well and spends uh, future years not often speaking highly of Clementi. One suspects that he didn't expect uh, that he did not expect the competition to be quite so close as it in fact was, Clementi being quite a talented performer and composer himself. But at any rate, we find Mozart trying to break into the existing musical economy in Vienna at the time. Now, in previous years, that musical economy had not included opera buffa, that is Italian, Italian language opera buffa, these comical, farcical, uh, broad, broad comedies. In fact, Emperor Joseph II had banned such, uh, such performances for several years prior to Mozart's arrival in Vienna. Uh, in favor of German spoken language pieces uh, in order to prop up, again, German language uh, cultural productions. But at any rate, 1783, when Mozart arrives back in Vienna, these types of operas, Italian buffa, had indeed been permitted to uh, appear on Viennese stages once more. They were incredibly popular, and in fact, it was in this genre that composers could truly count, to have, uh, count themselves to have made it. This was the most prestigious of musical genres at the time. We tend to think maybe of the symphony or other forms of absolute music today, like a Beethoven symphony as these sorts of pinnacles of music. But for Mozart at the time, in fact, it was opera where composers sought to secure their reputations, to make the most lucrative contracts and to impress the most people. This is where singers were often, uh, often held a disproportionate amount of power Composers often had to pay attention more to singers' whims than necessarily we think of composers today having this great idea and forcing it through. So Mozart wants to break into this economy. And we see him trying to do so in a letter that he writes to his father in 1783, where he describes a bit of the culture that he's dealing with and also some of the challenges that he is finding in trying to write an Italian opera buffa. Writing to his father, he says, well, the Italian opera buffa has started again here and is very popular. The buffo is particularly good. His name is Benucci. I have looked through at least a hundred libretti and more, but I've scarcely found a single one with which I am satisfied. That is to say, so many alterations would have to be made here and there, that even if a poet would undertake to make them, it would be easier for him to write a completely new text. Our poet here is now a certain Abate da Ponte, he has an enormous amount to do in revising pieces for the theater, and he has to write per obbligo an entirely new libretto for Salieri, which will take him two months. He has promised after that to write a new libretto for me, but who knows whether he will be able to keep his word or will want to. But indeed, I should dearly love to show what I can do in an Italian opera. So this is not Mozart, the sort of pinnacle of Western, uh, the Western musical canon that we know today. This is a Mozart who wants to show his chops to Viennese audiences. We see him invoke Benucci. This is where we get the idea of the singer having power. Part and parcel with imagining opera is to imagine or know the singers that you will have at your disposal for the opera. You need to know their talents. You need to know their limitations. So composers in this period, Mozart included, are constantly assessing various singers and thinking, oh, what type of music might I write for this person? What type of voice do they have and how might it uh, shine if given the appropriate aria? And we catch him doing that with, with Benucci. We also see him reading through scores of libretti, trying to find the perfect one that's going to uh, grab the imaginations of the Viennese audiences and keep them coming back for more. It's an arduous task, as he makes clear. He also mentions Lorenzo da Ponte. This is, in fact, the librettist for The Marriage of Figaro. 
they would go on to have an incredibly successful collaboration between the two of them that would result in three operas, The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, and Cosi Fan Tutte. These three operas are part of the operatic canon today. They are among the most performed in the world. So it's a very successful collaboration that these two have. However, as Mozart makes clear, that was not uh, at all clear to Mozart at the time of writing. In fact, De Ponte was incredibly busy. He had a number of other obligations to fulfill. And also, he invokes Antonio Salieri, the court composer at the time. Mozart here is worried that Lorenzo de Ponte's relationship with Salieri will threaten his opportunity to perform an opera buffa. At the time, Mozart, not being an Italian, is seeking to write an Italian comedy. However, there are numerous Italian musicians who are already in Vienna who have something of a stranglehold on the operatic economy, in the, in the, uh, especially in the opera buffa genre. So what he's worried about is not just that Salieri won't have time and that he'll have to wait in order to, or not Salieri, de Ponte, He's worried that De Ponte will not have time, but he's also worried, uh, as composers were at the time, of this sort of nebulous hierarchy, this sort of uh, courtly intrigues. Who is going to be saying, what about me to the emperor? Who is going to be trying to undermine me in this process? Will uh, the merits of my compositional ability actually be given the opportunity to shine when I have all of these uh, people who may be pulling against me? Now, the extent to which that is imagined and the extent to which that, are, that uh, threat is real is up for debate. But Mozart, at least, is under the impression that these are a very real threat to him breaking into the buffa genre. Fortunately for him, De Ponte does eventually agree to partner with him, and they get to the business of uh, choosing a topic for, for the uh, libretto, and Lorenzo gets to writing the text or the poetry. So in writing the poetry, this brings us to a critical function of the librettist in opera buffa at the time. So we typically think of a composer in our association with opera, but especially at this time, and indeed throughout much of opera history, composers were partnering with someone else to who would produce the libretto that the composer would set to music. So the opera does not start with a musical idea, it starts with a scenario, it starts with a play, it starts with a source that the librettist then turns into poetry and following cues that, that the librettist gives him, or sometimes ignoring or subverting those things, the composer sets to music what we see on stage. So Lorenzo de Ponte, uh, as they're searching around, lands on an incredibly uh, political satire from France by the playwright Pierre Beaumarchais. It is called The Crazy Day or The Marriage of Figaro. Uh, and this particular play had been set to German and attempted to was attempted to have been staged in Vienna, and Emperor Joseph II said no. It did not pass the censors. It was deemed too sort of politically provocative. This play has a lot of pointed things to say about the relationship between classes and the sort of uh, ineptitude of the nobility especially. So that being deemed a threat, that play was squashed. Now, the opera makes it. So why does that happen? Lorenzo de Ponte gives us an idea in the preface to the libretto. It involves reducing the play down and setting various passages to music, things that are not, again, satire or politically threatening, but in fact are endemic to the operatic genre at the time. So let's see what De Ponte says. To this end, that is producing this uh, text that you have or this libretto, I was obliged to reduce the 16 characters of which it, it the play consists to 11, two of which may be performed by a single person and to omit, apart from an entire act, many a charming scene and a number of jests and sallies, in place of which I have had to substitute canzonettas, arias, choruses, and other forms and words susceptible to music, things that become supplied only by verse but never by prose. In spite, however, of, of every effort and of all the diligence and care taken by the composer and by myself to be brief, the opera will not be one of the shortest to have appeared on our stage, for which we hope sufficient excuse will be found in the variety of the threads from which the action of this play is woven, the vastness and grandeur of the same, the multiplicity of the musical numbers that had to be made in order not to leave the actors too long unemployed, to diminish the vexation and monotony of long recitatives, and to express with varied colors the various emotions that occur, but above all in our desire to offer, as it were, a new kind of spectacle to a public of so refined a taste and such just understanding. 
So here we catch uh, DePonte doing a skillful bit of gamesmanship. He is a, uh, or catering to his audiences, calling them refined and of good taste. These are noble audiences anyway. They need to have their egos stoked. He also lets us in on a bit of that creative process, reducing the number of characters and injecting opportunities for song, whether they be canzonettas, arias, choruses. In so doing, what he's trying to do is create an opera that is entertaining. And in order to do that, it's not some commitment to the drama as this idea of the story, but rather a real pursuit of variety. What are opportunities for different characters to shine? What are the various musical forms that I can introduce into the opera? And all of this is in pursuit of avoiding the dreaded monotony. What the last thing you wanted was to have an audience have no reaction, to leave them inert and sort of in a stupor saying, that did nothing for me. Uh, so in order to do that, you have to give the actors, as he mentions, various moments to shine. You need to throw all these different plot lines at the audiences and let them enjoy the sort of interweaving of those plots. So that's a little bit of the background to the opera. And uh, let's get into now exactly what is happening to in, in this particular opera. Now, I could show, give you a whole long synopsis of the opera and have you read through that, but I think rather it's easier to watch those actual plots unfold in front of you in the theater. This is a theatrical piece meant to be seen and heard anyway. But I will give you the four principal sort of areas that the plot uh, interweaves and intersects and, and collapses into each other. So the first of these involves Susanna and Figaro. Figaro, our titular character, is getting married to Susanna, his bride. These are lower class characters and they, it is the morning of their wedding, and they're worried that the Count uh, is going to interfere with that. The Count, notably a philanderer, is invoking the Lord's right to first night and wants to take advantage of Susanna, and understandably, neither of them want that to stand. In the second uh, main sort of pairing plotline, we have the Count and the Countess, who got married at the end of the Barber of Seville, which we will discuss in a moment, but at this moment in time are unhappily married. Their love has stagnated and the Countess in particular is wondering where did we go wrong? The Count meanwhile is pursuing his own amorous uh, inclinations in ways that leave his, his uh, bride out in the cold. Our third plot line intersects with Figaro and Susanna uh, specifically as well. That involves principally Marcellina and Bartolo. These two are uh, are pursuing uh, Figaro for Marcellina. Uh, they're saying that Figaro needs to, needs to honor a contract uh, to pay a debt to Marcellina, otherwise he will break contract and will have to marry her. Obviously, this will get in the way of Figaro and Susanna's happiness. Fortunately for all involved, uh, Marcellina and Bartolo are eventually discovered to be Figaro's parents and thus uh, settles any issues outstanding uh, concerning, concerning the contract. And our final plot line involves the amorous awakenings of the young page boy Carabino. The, this uh, young page boy constantly gets in trouble because of this newly awakened love. He in particular irks the count, who is not able to sort of enter the domestic spaces of women as fluidly as Carabino can. And uh, Carabino seems to have the best of both worlds. He can take part in masculine privilege, and yet as a young boy is able to sort of engage with women in a way that the Count cannot do without uh, coming across as very threatening, which he does in this opera. Now, notably, part of the humor of Carabino derives from the fact that uh, following operatic practice of 18th century Vienna, he was not in fact sung by a young page boy or a young boy, he was in fact sung by a female mezzo-soprano. And so not only does this work in terms of timbre, it was expected, you got a more mature sound, someone with more training, it also works to sort of appease uh, the predominantly male gazes. Uh, it's very titillating for them to see a young page boy played by a woman who in this opera is uh, instilled to undress and then redress on stage uh, in a society, a noble society obsessed with hierarchies and properness. This was the closest they got to seeing that sort of activity. And so, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't note that this is a very prominent part of opera going culture at the time. So that's the four main plot points of the opera. And with that, 
we are expected to listen to what? It's the overture that we hear first. And we're going to listen now to the, the very opening of the overture and think about what that piece of music is doing to instill in us the type of comedy we are about to see. And then we'll relate that to some of the other broad strokes that this musical comedy is, is about. So first, the overture. So with that opening, Mozart is accomplishing so much in terms of what the audience is now uh, to expect out of this opera. In terms of setting mood, there are few composers who can do such a good job as Mozart. Uh, he starts out with this very simple sort of frenetic buzz, a very soft murmuring that gradually, but gradually crescendos into a bursting sort of sequence. And we are drawn perhaps to the sort of freneticism of the surface. We hear a lot of quicker, uh, smaller rhythmic units being articulated in various instruments. We hear too the murmuring, the sort of worried freneticism in the strings and the winds arching more gracefully over top, playing out different sort of moods that we are going to uh, approach in this opera. However, lest we be distracted too much by the surface sort of articulations, or rather, what allows us to pay attention to those surface articulations are, in fact, the rather simple harmonies and slow harmonic rhythm, meaning the harmony changes much more slowly than the note values as our ears hear them. So you hear a whole bunch of turbulence and busyness going on on the surface, and yet we are moving rather slowly on a sort of deeper harmonic level. And the harmonies themselves are, again, rather simple. So what that does is it allows Mozart to paint with rather broad strokes. We are dealing with comedy and farce. We need not get too learned or academic about this. This is supposed to be a romping good time. So rather than give us something too complicated to absorb at the beginning, we are given simple harmonies with a bunch of surface articulations. And in so doing, Mozart sort of grips us into the sort of foibles of the characters. We can imagine the, uh, the surface articulations in various instruments as the sort of characters interweaving and bubbling around as they go about this crazy day. Now the overture painting in these simple terms throws us right into the sense of the drama that we are, or the comedy especially, that we are about to watch. Now it's not the only simple means through which Mozart really drags us into, uh, drags us into this opera. In fact, De Ponte and Mozart were from the very beginning, thinking in terms of helping the audience access this wonderful comedy. For example, they chose to set The Marriage of Figaro, which is in fact a sequel to the story told in another opera, The Barber of Seville. This particular opera is again based on a play and had recently premiered in Vienna. Uh, it, had been it had been composed by the composer uh, Giovanni Paisiello, a very popular composer at the time, who composed several music for several operas. And in fact, the opera going audiences of the time would have been rather familiar with the story of the Barber of Seville. Therefore, their mind has to do a lot more work. There's a lot less content that they need to absorb on the front end of this story. At the end of the Barber of Seville, the Countess and the Count are very happily married. Having that situation under their, under their grasp, audiences would be pleasantly amused to see that this happy love story at the end, you know, after happily ever after, is a marriage that has gone awry, that has soured, that has stagnated and turned stale. And so again, Mozart and De Ponte are able to take advantage of that knowledge by, uh, by throwing the care us right into experiencing these characters, being able to count on the fact that we may have some exposure to them before we see the marriage of Figaro. Um, 
another sort of simple economic means through which we uh, through which they operate in terms of setting the drama up or to put it in a single location. And it's not just a single location, but it's a single location that's removed from the hustle and bustle of the daily life in Seville. It's at the Count Chateau outside of the city. And so what this does is it takes all of the competing motivations, concerns, worries, and uh, qualities of the characters, and it throws them into a pot and turns the kettle on during the opera, and that is what we get to experience. By setting them all in this one location, it's like putting them on an island. You allow all of these competing motives to come to a head, which makes for excellent comedy and makes for excellent drama. Another way that they are very efficient in how they convey information to the audience is in their choice of settings. We are given four acts and we are given four sets. Now, that has its own sort of simplicity to it, uh, but also, each of these sets serves to convey a wealth of information to the audience before we even hear anyone sing. So as we open act one, we will see an unfinished room with a chair in the center. This unadorned space immediately articulates to us that it is meant to be inhabited by those in a lower class. There are no rich adornments, no fancy lounge chairs, no paintings, etc., etc. And so what this allows us to do is view the Count entering this space as a true invasion. He is someone who will be richly gilded in his attire, and entering this plain unadorned space stands out like a sore thumb. And indeed, that is why Figaro is so able to treat him as an invasion of sorts. So too, uh, as Act Two opens, we will see the Countess uh, gazing out of a window in a magnificent room. There will also be these multiple doors, a large closet, and a window. Now, we may just see these as aspects of the architecture, but for Mozart's audience at the time, this clearly would have sent some signal about the activities that we are to expect in this comedic opera. We will see lots of comings and goings out of these various apertures. We will see uh, various members of the cast have no idea who is going in and out, who is behind what door, which character, who is who, and indeed, we, the audience, are able to see all of this unfold before us. And we're led to expect that right from the very beginning. So th there's a certain efficiency in how these sets are, are baked into the drama in order to convey a sort of maximum, uh, maximum knowledge to audiences at the time. Now, these are mainly visual and sort of backstory components to the simplicity and economy of the marriage of Figaro. But in fact, it also per, uh, permeates the text and the music. Lorenzo de Ponte and Mozart have to make sure that the audience is avoiding that tedium that uh, de Ponte wrote about in the preface to the libretto. So in order to do that, they convey again with very simple means a lot of information very quickly, things that tell us immediately what kinds of characters these persons are. So we're going to explore that in just the opening to this opera. We're going to look at act one, scene one. In this scene, uh, Figaro is measuring the marriage bed or measuring the space for the marriage bed for him and Susanna, giving us an indication of where his brain is. Well, Susanna is trying on a hat for their upcoming marriage. As you'll see in the Princeton Festival production, these two characters will be on opposite sides of the stage. And that sets up an interesting dialectic that we'll talk about in relation to the poetry and the music afterwards. But as you watch, take notice of the movement of the characters in this scene. And we'll talk about poetry and music after. Act one, scene one. <laughs> 
we gain so much out of just less than a minute and a half of music. These characters start on opposite sides of the stage, and then Mozart uh, gives us Figaro uh, acting as we might expect him to act. He's measuring again the space for this marriage bed, counting, counting, and anticipating uh, being married to Susanna with all of the privileges that that entails. Susanna, meanwhile, is uh, occupying a more idealistic space. She's looking at this veil and she's uh, in the original looking into a mirror and sort of imagining their, their future together and admiring herself in the mirror. And so what kind of music and what kind of text do we get for that? Let's start with the text. Figaro again measuring the room, he's counting out units. Susanna off to herself on a different side of the stage, singing, singing, singing. And we get immediately that these two are occupying different spaces. Their brains are on different things. Susanna tries to get Figaro's attention. And Mozart, as we hear, does an interesting thing when Susanna is saying, look, my dear Figaro, look at me. Now, yes, I am content. She's talking to Figaro. But Figaro, meanwhile, is still speaking the measurements. And so we hear the two musics going on at the same time. And we realize that these two characters are struggling with their communication in a humorous sort of way. Susanna, ever on the upswing with this sort of thing, is getting Figaro to pay attention to her, tries to get Figaro to pay attention to her. Eventually he does, and she then notes, and ah, on this the morning of our wedding, how delightful to my husband is this lovely little hat which Susanna made for herself. Now all of this sounds very pity, but in fact we've acquired a great deal of information. Knowing that this is a crazy day, we've been located in the morning, we know the sort of grand trajectory from this point forward. We're starting at the beginning and we'll trace an arc over into nighttime. We anticipate the wedding to come at some point during the day, as most weddings do. Now, also, this sets up an interesting dynamic right away between Figaro and Susanna. As I already mentioned, often they're dealing in their own separate spheres, and then Susanna cajoles Figaro into paying attention to her. And so, right away in this little uh, poetic interaction, we understand that part of the dynamic between these two characters is going to deal with their communication and their ability to relate to one another effectively. Now, that's not only uh, conveyed by the text, it's in fact secured and greatly augmented by the music. If we recall Figaro's opening line, as he measures out the lines very stolidly, understandably, he has a very simple sort of angular music. Quarter notes, if you look at the top line here, quarter notes that sort of jump up here and there. But again, very businesslike, very workmanlike, and very kind of earthy, very simple harmonic, uh, harmonic underpinning in, in the bottom line there. Meanwhile, Susanna is given a much more florid line. It sort of undulates in, in uh, arcs and waves. So too, she receives different sorts of instrumentations. And so Figaro is given his own theme, and Susanna is given her own theme. And right away, that allows us to hear sonically what we're seeing on stage. These two characters are contrasted. They're occupying different headspaces, just as they are occupying different musical spaces. Now, the interesting thing that Mozart does is first, as I mentioned, Susanna continues singing in this sense while Figaro continues to measure. And Susanna would like to have uh, Figaro pay attention to her. Now, what does she do in order to achieve that? Mozart does a very clever thing. He gives her Figaro's music. She hears what Figaro is doing and she says, okay, this is how I can get him to listen. Guardo un po' mio caro Figaro. Look at me, Figaro, look at me, Figaro. And the way that she gets Figaro to look at her is indeed by singing Figaro's music rather than her own music. And we see that in the music, in the opera that, or the clip that we just watched. She has to eventually walk over and hear Figaro pay attention to me. Now, Susanna carries a lot of power in this sense because what is the effect of her walking over and singing Figaro's music? In fact, Figaro hears her. And how does Figaro reciprocate? He sings Susanna's music. Si mio core più più bello sembra fata in per per te. That's Figaro finally responding in kind to Susanna. He is actually paying attention to her. And he demonstrates that by singing her motive. And so all we've really heard uh, account, all that we've really heard are two musical motives. And yet by 
pinning them on different characters and sort of marshalling when he deploys them with each of the characters, Mozart has deployed or, or has given us a wealth of information about the interaction between these two characters. First, they occupy a separate space, then Susanna uh, adopts Figaro's music, and then he, following her lead, adopts her music. And we'll see throughout the opera, these two characters interact in this way where communication is at the core of what they're doing. The ability to listen to their loved one and hear what they're saying is very important. And indeed in act four, it is Figaro listening to Susanna's voice that eventually leads him to identify her as Susanna, even though she is dressed up as the Countess. And yet we know that right away from the opening minute and a half of music that the listening relationship between these two characters will be key because of the Mozart that, uh, the music that Mozart gives us. Now, I just picked the opening of the opera. One could have chosen any number of scenes from this opera in which Mozart, again, is using very simple musical motives, very uh, attainable sort of noticeable passages, and working them through the, the grinder, the blender, the ringer, in all sorts of interesting ways that, again, lead to uh, an interpretive move on the part of the audience. They tell us lots of things about the character, and yet that was some of the most simple music you are going to hear in an opera. So that concludes our sort of uh, exploration of the way that simplicity contributes to our sense of character, characters in this opera, our sense of place in this opera. It's a very economic opera in that sense. Now what that allows us to do is it frees our brains up to focus on all of the crazy things that the characters are doing. So with that, we'll close this lecture on the background and the opening of the opera. And we're going to turn in our next lecture to a couple of the key characters in this show. Talk about how their music works and what that means in terms of viewing this opera. So I hope you enjoyed our first lecture and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye-bye.